on Network Africa. Prominent Tanzanian opposition figure Tundu Lisu nominated to run for presidency in October's general elections by his Chidema party. Social media users across the continent joined the Zimbabwean Lives Matter campaign to condemn the crackdown on opposition politicians and journalists in Zimbabwe as President Emerson Mnangagwa vows to flush out bad apples plus. Algeria's president plans the gradual reopening of mosques in the country. Hello and a warm welcome to the program. I'm Tenyola Shuboale. We begin in East Africa, where prominent Tanzanian opposition figure Tundu Lisu has been nominated to run for the presidency in October's general elections by his Chidema party. He fled the country after narrowly uh, surviving an attempt on his life in the capital, Dodoma, in September 2017. He survived the attack with life-changing injuries after receiving treatment in Belgium and returned to the country only last week. Mr. Lisu, who has been a fierce critic of President John Magafuli over the last four years will now challenge President Magafuli in the October vote. Mr. Lisu got 405 votes out of the 442 cast by members of his party's National Council. To Southern Africa, Zimbabwe's President Emerson Mnangagwa has given a stark warning to opposition figures and human rights campaigners amid a growing uproar over corruption and economic mismanagement. In an unexpected televised address on Tuesday, the President condemned the schemes of what he called destructive terrorist opposition groupings. He said those who promote hate and disharmony will never win the bad apples that have attempted to divide our people and to weaken our systems will be flushed out, adding that good shall triumph over evil. Opposition supporters and activists had last week called for anti-government protests, but security agencies ordered people to stay indoors. Some activists, including Booker Long-listed author Sisi Dangaremba, were arrested and later released on bail. Zimbabwe lawyers for human rights say more than 60 people have been detained so far. Let's get more on this story from Zimbabwean journalist Nigel Yamatumbu. Hello, Nigel. Uh, what's the response been to President Mnangagwa's speech this morning? It was rather unexpected, wasn't it? Yes, uh, President Mnangagwa's speech today was rather bizarre in a number of ways, a lot of ways. First, it was really unexpected. Uh, there is no real national uh, event or real national activity. It was even uh, a, a bit confusing that he had to address the nation on a day that uh, uh, his cabinet, his executive, meets. So it was really bizarre. Even when you look at the contents of the speech, it was just pregnant with rhetoric. Uh, of a played statements uh, that did not uh, in any way fit to the national discourse. So generally the reactions in Zimbabwe are uh, 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 that of uh, shock, uh, dismay, and really a sense of uh, uh, betrayal, a really sense of a death of leadership uh, that uh, surely our president and the national leadership could have done better. We don't know who that message was directed to as there was no message in the first place. Uh, lawyers for human rights say more than 60 people have been detained. Are there concerns about repression, especially on the back of that speech from the president, in which he vows to flush out the bad apples? Yes, the number of people in Zimbabwe that are being harassed, arrested, victimized, uh, is going up, and uh, it really is uh, a matter of concern. And among those that are being targeted are journalists, 
uh, opposition activists and 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 some from within the civil society and uh, NGO sector. And uh, this has really been uh, prompted uh, a hashtag Zimbabweans Life Matter, uh, which uh, uh, started to trend yesterday on Twitter uh, through the efforts by uh, South African opposition leader Mumusi Maimani, Julius Malema, uh, among among other prominent figures within that country, and uh, which has also been taking center stage uh, within the region and indeed the world. It is indeed of concern, and um, really, I think the message has to be put across that. Uh, dissenting voices are not criminals. Journalists and journalism is not a crime. And the message has to be put out there uh, that um, merely expressing one's view is not a license for jail, is not a license uh, to be repressed. So something surely, certainly, has to be done to improve the democracy and human rights situation in Zimbabwe. All right, a lot to keep our eyes on there. Thanks for your reporting, Nigel. We're still on the situation in Zimbabwe. As you heard Nigel say there, social media users across the continent have joined the Zimbabwean Lives Matter campaign to condemn the military-led crackdown and arrest of opposition politicians and journalists in Zimbabwe. They're calling for Zimbabwe's government to respect the rights of those protesting against alleged human rights abuses and corruption. The campaign started in Zimbabwe, where activists told their stories of detention. Many in the continent have urged President Emerson Mnangagwa's government to engage with its critics as opposed to arresting them. Let's bring in media analyst and academic Stanley Karombo to get more perspective on the situation. He joins us live from Johannesburg. Thank you so much for joining us on Network Africa. Thank you for having me. So what do you make of uh, President Emerson Mnangagwa's speech today, his stern warning to opposition and critics? If anything, it makes the nation more angrier and people are frustrated and despondent. The speech to me is so hollow and it doesn't add anything to the people's situation right down in Zimbabwe, where many times people are going in the night without anything to put on their tables. You know, this clampdown on the opposition, human rights lawyers say more than 60 people have been detained, including activists and journalists in, in the past few days. What does this say concerning the government of Menangagwa? Are we seeing a mirror of Robert Mugabe's rule, perhaps? I can tell you uh, from where I sit here, right, uh, where, from where I sit that uh, if anything at all, we can see a more and more yeah, face of Mnangagwa. I think this comes down to the effect that this regime came through the military. So we expect much from the military uh, regime. And uh, many people are now even contemplating and saying that uh, the Mugabe regime was much, much better than the current regime because when, uh, when President Munanga came into power, he was assisted to come into power by the military. And there was a kind of hope. But now, as the situation stands, the people are more despondent and that hope has faded. And the military now has shown its true colors where they are going in, into the houses of people and they brutally attack them not only specific organizations, members, but journalists and those people who are voicing their dissent on the government. I think if I understand what you're saying, it's quite scary that you're saying that it's even worse than uh, Robert M uh, Mugabe's rule. Amid this and amid rising tension, is there a role regional leaders or the African Union could play in Zimbabwe before things get out of hand? Frankly speaking, the, the things on the ground, as we say, they are already out of, they are already out of uh, 
their, their bed. The center can no longer hold. The center in Zimbabwe can no longer hold. And the fact that it's very unfortunate that the SAD and the EU are very conspicuous because of, of their non challenge voices. Their voices are mute, and it's high time now we unmute those voices and call a spread a spread. It's very unfortunate that many a times SADAC and the AU go with this brotherly approach to issues in Africa in general and SADAC in particular. It's also unfortunate that uh, yeah, President uh, Cyril Ramaphosa as the, C, as the AU chair is conspicuous by his silence. He did not say anything as far as the situation on the ground is, as far as the situation in Zimbabwe concerned. Only the opposition parties in South Africa, like the EF, have shown that they are with the people of the, of the they are with the people in Zimbabwe. Unlike the president himself, he, uh, Ramaphosa, he's just considered silent. I'm not surprised by his silence. Uh, long back when the situation in Zimbabwe was so bad, the former president, Thabo Mbeki, said there was no crisis in Zimbabwe, but things were bad by that time. And actually was talking of quiet diplomacy. I think it's high time now that that can not continue with that quiet diplomacy. It's high time they should call a spade a spade and say things in Zimbabwe are bad and the center can no longer hold. Uh, media analyst and academic, Mr. Stanley Karombo, thank you so much for your insights on this situation. Away from Zimbabwe, South Africa's National Persecuting Authority has announced that it will be persecuting those behind the Up Money Pyramid scheme, which allegedly swindled more than 230,000 cost uh, consumers, I beg your pardon. A high court in Johannesburg granted the assets forfeiture unit of the NPA a preservation order to freeze bank accounts worth more than 18 million rand and a number of luxury vehicles associated with the directors of the parent company of the scheme, Up Money and Unitco. Uh, the pyramid scheme, which is neither registered with the Reserve Bank, registered Stockbell, nor a financial services provider, mainly use social media to recruit its members. New participants were required to pay a once-off join-in fee of 180 rand. This qualifies them for a meat pack. They will then have to recruit five other new participants for just level one. Following request from the NCC, the Financial Intelligence Centre traced how the funds were laundered through various methods, accounts and transactions. This is reckless and fraudulent conduct of business. This is fraud, this is theft. But it's also contravention of the Banks Act and the Financial Services Act in that they don't have a license to be um, obtaining cash or getting deposits from the public. The criminal case is still, in, is, is still continuing. Very soon there'll be arrests. And, and as, as I've said, um, the asset for future unit, after 90 days, we, go, we are going to have this property for fitted to the state. In due course, of course, the matter will be referred to um, the National Prosecution Services, um, for charges to be brought against um, the directors of the two companies that are referred to. We in Asset for Future Unit use a civil standard. We don't have to wait for a criminal case to be concluded as long as there are reasonable grounds, which is a civil standard, that these are proceeds of crime, we proceed to freeze the assets and forfeit them to the state. Still ahead on the program. An Egyptian robot takes orders and serves food in Cairo restaurants to curb the spread of the coronavirus. Don't want to miss it. Stay with us. Thanks for staying with us. The UN is raising concerns about April. 
possible humanitarian disaster in Libya in light of the current escalation and mobilization around CERT and the organization fears that this could lead to military operations. UN spokesperson Farhan Haq says the lives of more than 125,000 people in and around CERT were at great risk. He adds that COVID-19 cases continued to increase across Libya with 3,837 cases reported and 83 deaths to date, most of them in the western and southern parts of the country. The UN remains concerned about a possible humanitarian disaster in Libya should the current escalation and mobilization around CERT lead to military operations. The lives of more than 125,000 people in and around CERT are at great risk. COVID-19 cases continue to increase across Libya with 3,837 cases reported and 83 deaths to date, most of them in the western and southern parts of the country. Capacity for testing, tracing, and treating people remains extremely low across the country and continues to be concentrated in Tripoli and Benghazi. In response to the severe shortage of swabs for testing in the south, health authorities in Tripoli have dispatched a shipment of 20,000 swabs to Seva. Fuel shortages and electricity cuts of more than 18 hours a day are exacerbating poor living conditions for many across the country. Health facilities have also suffered from electricity cuts, forcing some to temporarily suspend operations. The UN and humanitarian partners are at the forefront in supporting the national authorities with its COVID-19 response, particularly in the provision of health supplies and personal protection equipment. Algerian President Abdel Majid Toubon has tasked his Prime Minister to look into the gradual reopening of mosques in the country. The President, during a meeting of the High Security Council, instructed Prime Minister Abdelaziz Jarad to start by focusing on large mosques that have a capacity of a thousand people. He said the large mosque will be able to allow the essential physical distancing with the imperative wearing of face masks by all. The Prime Minister will also oversee gradual reopening of public spaces, including beaches and parks, for recreation and relaxation. Mosque beaches and parks were closed in March to spread the spread of the coronavirus. Algeria has reported approximately 30,000 cases of the coronavirus. While public transportation is gradually returning to Nigeria as commercial flights resume at the Yakubu Gowon Airport in Plateau State, northern Nigeria, this is after four months of inactivity as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. Over 80 passengers were on board for the inbound flight from Lagos to Jos after the Federal Airport Authority put in place all necessary materials in compliance with directives and guidelines for the resumption of airport activities. The Yakubo Gawan Airport in Jos, the Plateau State capital, is back to life with the resumption of activities after a ban on flights across the country took effect in March due to the COVID-19 pandemic. In adherence to the safety directives and guidelines of the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19, the airport managers have put in place the necessary equipment needed for staff and passenger safety with the provision of disinfectants for luggage, hand wash points, hand sanitizers, as well as maintenance of specified physical distancing at the departure and arrival points. It's been a long wait for passengers eager to get on the plane as they braved the unfriendly weather in the early hours of the day. And in line with the new developments, they go through the drills of being sprayed with disinfectant, temperature checks and washing of hands before admittance to the terminal area where they wait eagerly for their flight. Before we actually start, we have put many things in place for the safety of the passengers. You can see we have a wash in basin there. We have, a, on the inside, we have taps. We don't need soap all over. I actually plead with the, the passenger to please use all these things. And when the plane eventually landed, it was a reflection of how passengers had been longing for the trip, with 86 passengers arriving from Lagos, while 50 boarded for the return trip.
a big relief for many. At first I was a bit skeptical, but with what I have seen on ground, I think it's safe, our lives are coming back to normal, and um, it's wonderful, it's wonderful. At the airport, um, the arrangements, the protocols have been very, very okay. But I was surprised that when we entered the flight, there was no physical distance in the, in the, in the flight. No space was left. You, I mean, all the spaces were filled up. It was unlike what you saw at the airport. The gradual resumption of flights in airports across the country means passenger activity will no longer be the same, with the COVID-19 protocols now a permanent feature in addition to the usual security checks. And finally on the program, an Egyptian restaurant uses a robot waiter to wait on customers in an effort to limit contact amid the coronavirus pandemic. Adorned with its own name tag, the An Apron, the robot named Mozo, which means waiter in Spanish, is programmed to take orders and deliver meals to tables. Take a look. As Egypt loosens coronavirus restrictions, one restaurant decided to let robots wait at tables in a bid to attract customers who wish to limit human interaction. Mozo works in tandem with the restaurant's human staff, whose role is now limited to entering a passcode to confirm each table's orders and then place the food platters on the robot's specially designed trays. Launched at Kimbo Restaurants and Cafe in Cairo on July 14th, Mozo is the only robot in Egypt waiting tables so far. When the problem of coronavirus started in Egypt, Egyptian culture started thinking more about social distancing. We thought about making a robot and called it Mozo. And that was the first time a Mozo was brought to Egypt. We characterize it with its own name tag, its own tie and apron, so it can look cute to Egyptians who are seeing the robots moving around them for the first time. Al Hawaini adds that the robot was designed to look as friendly as possible to Egyptians who are not used to being around a moving robot. Everyone is afraid. Almost no one leaves their homes. People in restaurants have become much less. So I think this is a good idea at a restaurant, where instead of having another human being come near you, there is a robot. Egypt has allowed cafes and restaurants to return to work after the coronavirus measures were lifted under the condition that they close at midnight and limit their capacity to 50 percent. The North African country has been reporting dwindling numbers of coronavirus cases, the latest being less than 200 cases a day. In total, the country has recorded over 94,000 cases and more than 4,800 deaths. Well, as long as it's not the robots making the food, I'm all for it. That's the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Tenny Olashubo Ale. Bye for now. <laughs>